Today I'm going to talk about diseases of the dog and cat. It would be impossible to cover all the diseases of the dog and cat in two hours. And so I'm going to confine my presentation to entities which we have recently investigated at the University of Pennsylvania or in collaboration with other universities. Some of these have been published in the last few years and others are in various stages of publication between abstract and in press. I will cover the topics by organ system, and most presentations will include title slides from uh, the authors of these uh, investigations. I'm deeply indebted to the anatomic and clinical pathologists on our staff and at other universities, and to the many clinical staff, residents, and faculty from our hospital who have contributed to this presentation. Okay, next slide. I'm going to start out with those uh, diseases that involve multiple systems. And the first uh, condition I'm going to talk about is thromboembolic disease in the dog. Thromboembolic disease in the dog has been associated with a wide variety of conditions, many of them listed here. However, I'm going to concentrate on primary thromboses. Those types of thromboembolic disease where we don't have an underlying cause such as vegetative endocarditis, neoplasia, or heartworm disease. We have defined primary thrombotic disease in the dog as thrombi found in one or more of the three major vascular beds without evidence of an embolic cause. The first group I want to talk about are portal vein thrombi. Now this is a somewhat older slide. We now have approximately 30 cases of portal vein thrombi. But in this first group that we looked at, about 10 of the dogs had thrombi in only the portal vein, where six dogs had both portal vein and pulmonary artery thrombi, and one dog had portal vein, pulmonary artery, and aortic thrombi. Here's a typical case of portal thrombosis in the dog. Here's the liver. There's the portal vein filled with a large thrombus. It's the pancreas and the duodenum. Here's another liver with a cast of the portal vein made of thrombus. And this thrombus also extends out through the main portal vein. These thrombi are usually attached to the vessel wall, uh, sometimes very loosely, others by organizing uh, granulation tissue. And we have associated this first group of thrombi, and this basically holds true for what we've seen recently, with a variety of diff different conditions. Steroid therapy being the most common, but we've also seen them with inflammation of the abdomen, particularly pancreatitis and peritonitis. And also we've seen a few with uh, round cell tumors such as lymphosarcoma or myeloproliferative disease. We also looked at aortic thromboemboli, and in those dogs with aortic thromboemboli, we probably now have 50 to 60 of these dogs, um, 24 of them involved only the aorta and systemic arteries. However, there were a group of eight dogs that also had pulmonary artery involvement, and one dog each with pulmonary artery and portal vein involvement and involvement of the anterior vena cava. All of these are separated by a capillary bed, so these could not be embolic. Here's an example of a portal, I mean, a uh, aortic thrombus uh, forming a cast here at the bifurcation of the aorta. And these are not emboli, these are usually attached at this site. Again, the attachment sites are often very chronic. Um, this one has granulation tissue and fibrous connective tissue at the connection between the vessel wall and the chronic thrombus. And we associated these thrombi with a variety of conditions. Uh, listed here, including disease of the vessel wall itself, renal disease, pancreatic necrosis, and corticosteroid therapy, similar to what we've seen in other cases of thromboembolic disease. We also looked at a group of dogs with emboli in the aorta, and those dogs all had some disease of the heart or the major blood vessels where the thrombus would have formed and then proceeded to embolize to the aorta. And those are somewhat different than the primary aortic thrombi. Uh, 
We also looked at a large group of dogs with pulmonary artery thromboemboli. We now probably have over 100 of these dogs. And again, most of the dogs had pulmonary artery involvement only. However, there was a significant group that had other vascular bed involvement as well. Here's the heart, the lung, and there is a large pulmonary artery thrombus in this dog. Here's another example. This is the aortic valve, and this is a large pulmonary thrombus. Dogs usually only have clinical signs of pulmonary artery thromboembolic disease when approximately uh, 40 to 60 percent of the pulmonary arteries are occluded. And interestingly enough, when we look at these pulmonary arteries, we can see that there is a chronic attachment site and then a more fibrinous thrombus. And as we go deeper into the lung, the lesions become more and more chronic. And again, I'll remind you, none of these dogs had heartworm disease. What we have found in general is if you look at the periphery of the lung, the lesions are chronic. As you go towards the hilus of the lung, the lesions are more acute. And Therefore, we believe, as occurs in humans, that these thrombi start in the periphery of the lung and build up back and grow toward the heart. And if we look at the conditions that have been associated with pulmonary artery thromboemboli in the dog, we have a large number of conditions. However, 28 of the dogs had involvement of hyperadrenal corticism, either induced or uh, natural. A large group of animals had renal disease, but they were not all glomerulonephritis and amyloidosis with protein-losing nephropathy. Significant number of them just had chronic interstitial nephritis. Um, and also we saw dogs with uh, pancreatic necrosis, protein-losing enteropathy, and hemolytic anemia. We've also seen a number of cases and recently reported on animals with anterior vena cava thrombi. Here's the uh, right heart and this is the vena cava opened up, and these extend into the jugular veins. These animals usually present with severe facial edema and swelling, and if you don't carefully look at the jugular veins and the anterior vena cava, you'll miss the cause of these cases of facial swelling and death. So the question is, what is causing all these thromboemboli in the dogs? And so if you go back to the original work done by Virchow, where he suggested a triad of things that lead to thrombosis, endothelial injury, alterations in flow, such as stasis or um, turbulence, and hypercoagulability. In most of our cases, we have no evidence that there is end endothelial injury. There are very few cases where we can de define alterations in flow. So we think these animals must have some sort of hypercoagulability or hypothrombolysis. This is a diagram from Slauson and Cooper just talking about some of the molecular events that might be involved in these uh, processes. But I think the most important thing is probably this area right here. We think for some reason thrombi formed, but the problem is how to lyse them. And it turns out that in most mammals, the only way to lyse thrombi is through plasmin, and the only way to turn that on is through plasminogen activators. This is just a list uh, from Robbins of, of the anti-thrombotic uh, conditions in blood vessels and pro-thrombotic conditions. And what we have found most interesting is looking at questions of fibrinolysis. That is, as mentioned in the previous slide, tissue plasminogen activator levels and plasminogen activator inhibitors. So again, going back to hypercoagulability and hypothrom thrombolysis, um, people have looked at coagulation cascades, proteins, and not found elevations. We certainly do see deficiencies of antithrombin-3 in the dog, although in most cases they're not severe enough to lead to uh, disease. Um, so our concerns are mostly, again, at plasminogen activators. And the way uh, this fits together uh, is that we know that plasminogen activators are involved in making plasminogen become plasmin, uh, and then that leads to fibrinolysis, uh, and this is probably active at all times in the body, and the plasminogen activator inhibitors are involved um, in uh, turning these promoters on. And it turns out corticosteroids are able to effectively reduce levels of TPA in the species that have been looked at, and that's where we think hyperadrenal corticism fits in here. We think uh, 
plasmin is not being able to be turned on. And many different renal disease again, mostly that this work has been done in laboratory animals, not in the dog, uh, there is evidence that plasminogen activator inhibitors are involved also in those conditions. So we think this may be more important than antithrombin-3 levels, although we have no evidence in the dog. It's merely speculation at this point. Recent evidence in humans points to coronary artery disease as being associated with elevated levels of plasminogen activator inhibitors as well. Okay, enough of that topic. This is a study that was done by Dr. Lyndon Craig in our lab and involves looking at proportions of death caused by neoplasia in five dog breeds. This was a necropsy survey done at our institution. What she did is looked at the popular dog breeds and these four dogs, Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds and Rottweilers are currently the four most popular dog breeds in the United States. Boxers were picked because they're a known uh, breed that has a very high incidence of neoplasia. So what she did is looked at the incidence of neoplasia at death and the incidence of death caused by non-neoplastic diseases in these five breeds. And what she found is that when we compared percentages of death caused by neoplasia, even though the boxer has been known for years as uh, a breed that has a very high incidence of neoplasia that can lead to death. Um, it turned out the golden retrievers actually have a higher percentage of their deaths caused by neoplasia, almost 57 percent, where for boxers it was around 52 percent. And for the German Shepherd, Labrador, and Rottweiler, a significantly lower percentage of uh, death caused by neoplasia. When we divide up and look at each breed individually, we can also see that there are some similarities and some differences between these breeds. For one thing, when we look at golden retrievers, their uh, deaths due to neoplasia were predominantly due to hemangiosarcoma, lymphosarcomas, and carcinomas, with a relatively small number of deaths due to neoplasia in other organs. This is somewhat similar to what we see in the Labrador retriever, where again, the predominant uh, percentages of were hemangiosarcoma, lymphosarcoma, and carcinoma. Of course, the actual deaths due to neoplasia in the laboratory retriever were much lower than that in um, the golden retriever. And when we look at the German Shepherd, again, a similar incidence, a lot of hemangiosarcoma, a lot of lymphosarcoma, and a lot of carcinomas, few of the others. So a very similar looking pie uh, to that of the retrievers. However, when we look at the Boxer, it's a very different story. Even though they have a high incidence of lymphosarcoma, very few hemangiosarcoma and even fewer carcinomas, with large numbers of central nervous system tumors, mostly glial tumors, and endocrine tumors. And if we look at the Rottweiler, we see another very different story. That is, lymphosarcoma was a large number of the neoplasms and a very large number of malignant histiocytomas and malignant fibrous histiocytomas. We elected to lump these together, or Dr. Craig elected to lump these together, because in some animals we clearly see malignant fibrous histiocytoma, a sarcoma, probably of myofibroblast origin, uh, which marks very nicely with actin and uh, vimentin, where malignant histiocytosis marks with histiocytic markers. However, we've seen a number of dogs where the two tumors seem to be present simultaneously in the same site. Uh, so we're really not sure how we divide these up best at this point. If you look at the non-neoplastic deaths, it's very interesting because the golden retriever and the Labrador retriever have a very high percentage of renal disease. And in the Labrador retriever, the vast majority of those renal disease deaths are due to um, Borrelia burgdorferi associated nephritis or Lyme nephritis, and we'll talk about that later. Where in the golden retriever, we have lots of Lyme nephritis, but we also have a large number of animals with renal dysplasia, which we and others have reported in the past. Much lower percentage of deaths due to other diseases. So in the golden retriever, uh, almost 75% of the deaths are neoplasia and renal disease. And in the Labrador retriever, over half of their deaths were due to renal disease and uh, neoplasia. 
When we look at the non-neoplastic deaths in the German Shepherd and the Rottweiler, they're quite different. Uh, and in the German Shepherd and the Rottweiler, the GI tract diseases are very highly represented. In the German Shepherd, these were mostly gastric dilation, gastric dilation in volvulus, and intestinal uh, torsions, mesenteric root torsions. However, in the Rottweiler, although some of those were also present, the vast majority of these were parvoviral enteritis. So we saw a lot more Rottweilers dying of parvovirus than any of the other uh, breeds. And in the Boxer, an uh, entirely different story. Heart disease were uh, the most non-neoplastic deaths and non-neoplastic non diseases of the central nervous system. When we look at the average age of death um, from various conditions, neoplasia in the uh, blue, all deaths in green, and those due to uh, non-neoplastic disease in yellow, we can see that the average age of death between the Golden Retriever and the German Shepherd was not dramatically different. However, we had a significantly younger age of death for both the Boxer Dog and the Rottweiler. The Rottweilers were probably all due to this young age of death was due to um, the non-neoplastic deaths being due to parvoviral enteritis. However, we're not exactly sure why the Boxers seem to die so young. It's not as obvious as the Rottweiler. Okay, in conclusion, we found a higher proportion of golden retrievers and boxers dying of neoplasia compared to the other three common breeds. And the average age of deaths was similar for golden retrievers, Labradors, and German Shepherds, but much lower for boxers and Rottweilers. This may be of interest to people who are looking at uh, genetic causes for neoplasia and the association of genetic diseases uh, with um, environmental causes as a cause of neoplasms. Okay, next I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that I've done with Dr. Colleen Brady and the other people in our critical care group. Um, and they are defining severe sepsis in cats and then defining bacterial pneumonia in the cats. There's not a lot of pathology in these studies, but I thought you should be aware of them. This one has as has been the last one, has been accepted for publication and should be published within the next year. Um, sepsis is a clinical syndrome resulting from disseminated bacterial infection and the associated inflammatory response. Uh, and we try to define both SIRS, sepsis, which is this, severe sepsis, which means sepsis with organ failure, and septic shock in this paper. Septic shock is a uh, severe sepsis which does not respond to fluid therapy. And this is uh, a consensus statement uh, by a number of groups, including some of those in human medicine. And so we have proposed criteria for the diagnosis of SIRS in cats based on this uh, study. And even our clinicians agree that necropsy is the gold standard for making this uh, diagnosis. Uh, what we did is we looked for animals that had bacterial infections that were disseminated with thrombi or multifocal random necrosis in two or more organ systems. And we found all of those cases, which amounted to 100 or so animals. And then we made the association with those, had a good enough clinical record that we could define their clinical illness. The primary diagnosis in these animals in, uh, involves a whole series of different things, but uh, certainly pyothorax and septic peritonitis were the most common primary condition in these animals, with GI tract uh, bacteremia being involved in five cases. And then there were cases of pneumonia, bacterial endocarditis, and a few cases of pyelonephritis, and individual cases of uh, these three conditions. Uh, this is just my slide to remind you that I did my training at Cornell, where you know if you have a case of pyothorax, you carefully wash the lungs to look for the rupture in the lung. In this case, there was a stick that went down the bronchus, uh, formed an abscess here, and then broke into the chest to cause the pyothorax. And certainly, if you look carefully these, for these, you will find ruptured lung abscesses as one of the causes of pyothorax in the cat.
What we found as far as infectious agents were that 17 cases had gram-negative rods, 10 had gram-positive cocci, and 9 cases were mixed infections. Uh, FELV testing had been done on 18 animals, and 18 of the 18 were negative. There weren't a significant number of animals that had FIV testing done to report it. And we found no fungi in these animals. Our conclusions were basically that um, severe sepsis is somewhat different in the cat than in the dog, and that is particularly the findings we found that were different were bradycardia, icterus, and anemia. Uh, and so when we're looking at cats now in our clinic that have these conditions, hyperthermia or hypothermia, bradycardia, tachypnea, and these other changes, then we uh, become concerned that they might have sepsis. Um, we're not exactly sure of the pathogenesis of the anemia and the icterus, but it appears that these animals are hemolyzing their red cells, and that accounts for both the anemia and the icterus. Okay, next we're going to go on to uh, lung diseases, and the first we're going to talk about was an extension of the previous study, also done by Dr. Brady, looking at bacterial pneumonia in cats. And these are 30 different cases than the previous ones. In this case, we use two different inclusion criteria, either evidence of radiographic evidence of alveolar disease and endotracheal lavage with cytologic evidence of inflammation and a positive bacterial culture, or post-mortem histopathologic evidence of bacterial pneumonia. We excluded animals with heart disease, neoplasia, bronchial disease or asthma, acute respiratory distress syndrome, mostly because we're writing another paper on that, we didn't want to get things confused, and we also excluded kittens. And of course, we excluded all animals with an incomplete medical record, and at our institution, that gets rid of most of the cases. However, we are left with 30 animals that had inflammation of the lung parenchyma um, with alveolar and bronchiolar disease with a lot of inflammatory cells and fibrin. Um, and again, our clinicians agree that you have to look at these histologically to be absolutely sure they're pneumonias. What we found as far as culture uh, from the animals that had a single population of bacteria is we saw a lot of staph, pseudomonas, E. coli, and pasteurella. And when we look at the bacterial culture when there was a mixed population, we also see a lot of staph, pseudomonas, E. coli, and pasteurella with a very few Bordetella cases. As far as necropsy goes, um, most of the animals had a uh, severe necrosuppurative bronchopneumonia. Some of them were defined as fibrinosuppurative, with or without uh, abscesses. And we found intralesional bacteria, of course, in all the cats. And in one cat, there was also intravascular bacteria, suggesting it might have had sepsis as well. Grossly, these lungs are not very impressive. They feel uh, more interesting than they look. Uh, you can feel small nodular areas and thickenings in these lungs. Sometimes they're more obvious grossly, and certainly most of these lungs will sink in water or formalin. Here's another example where we saw a lot of small foci, mostly at the periphery, and that goes along with the radiographic evidence in these cats. Uh, histologically, there was lots of necrosis, often mats of bacteria surrounded by neutrophils and fibrin. Again, these are mostly uh, pink because of lots of fibrin and lots of dead neutrophils. Gram stain, we found both gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria in these cases. So our conclusions were that um, they f were able to, uh, as a part of doing this study, define uh, bacterial pneumonias clinically, and we found that animals, particularly with a history of vomiting or coughing, uh, should alert uh, the clinician to bacterial pneumonia as well as tachypnea and auscultation abnormalities. And uh, many of them also had upper respiratory infections, so we wonder about a possible viral uh, cause in some of these as a predisposition to the bacteria. We found many of the animals did not have a fever and were not, uh, did not have a leukocytosis. The alveolar pattern of d was very variable on radiographs, so that wasn't very consistent, but we did find a rather common group of bacterial pathogens. So we hope this will help to uh, 
uh, allow people to better define this uh, clinically so that hopefully more of these kitties can live. The non-survivors tended to be hypothermic and anemic uh, and have very low albumin, probably because of all being spilled out into the tissues from the inflammation, and have relatively low heart rates. Okay, the next uh, thing I want to talk about is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, we have uh, published some papers on this in the dog and we are working on it in the cat. Um, it's defined a number of different ways, but we have defined it as a syndrome of diffuse alveolar injury with rapid onset of respiratory insufficiency, which is refractile to oxygen therapy and frequently proceeds to multisystemic failure. This work was mostly done by Dr. Chantal Perrant. And our clinical cr criteria were acute distress, progression to failure with no evidence of cardiac disease. Our pathologic criteria were based on what's been done in humans and in the horse. Uh, we want gross or histologic evidence of diffuse or very extensive lung injury. Uh, and in the acute phase, we see hemorrhage, congestion, edema, inflammation, and hyaline membranes. In the subacute phase, we see type 2 cell proliferation with one or more of these. And in the chronic phase, we see interstitial fibrosis and type 2 cell proliferation. And of course, most animals in uh, the world don't live to this phase because they die in either this phase or this phase. Grossly, the lungs are remarkable in the fact that they usually uh, do not deflate when the chest is open. They're quite firm, uh, and they sink in formalin or water. Histologically, in the acute phase, uh, we're basically dealing with an acute interstitial pneumonia, outpouring of neutrophils, fibrin, congestion of the blood vessels. And again, the, often the bronchi and bronchioles look completely normal in these animals. We will get hyaline membranes or collections of fibrin and surfactant in some of these animals. And uh, after the hyaline membrane formation occurs and we start to get type 2 cell proliferation in the lungs in the subacute phase after a few days. And this can become quite extensive, lining many of the alveoli. Rarely did we have animals progress beyond the subacute phase because again, even to maintain life at this point, they have to have been on the ventilator for a number of days. Occasionally, we would see some animals with areas of fibrosis and extensive type 2 cell proliferation. Um, what we found as far as predisposition, predisposing conditions in the dog were infection, and sometimes that was ventilator acquired. Uh, inhalation of gastric contents and smoke were a common cause of direct lung injury. Oxygen toxicity, which is a different form of ventilator acquired toxicity, and trauma. Uh, as far as systemic causes, we saw animals with sepsis and shock, trauma, DIC, and one animal with a gastric uh, dilation and volvulus that all ended up with ARDS. So in summary, we identified 19 dogs and reported on them with severe respiratory distress and histologic changes compatible with the acute respiratory distress syndrome. We found seven dogs were in the acute phase, 12 dogs uh, were in the subacute phase, and two of those had a little bit of fibrosis. And these, again, were the predisposing conditions. So we think this is out there in the dog. It's important to be able to recognize it histologically and understanding what the predisposing conditions are. Now, of course, you can see similar lesions in things like canine distemper and toxoplasmosis, and those have to be eliminated. And hopefully, within the next year or two, we'll put out something on this in the cat as well. Okay. Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, a couple of things uh, involving the heart. The first is feline cardiomyopathy. Again, this is an old summary slide. Um, and at this time, when we summarized this and uh, published these papers, we were seeing approximately equal numbers of uh, dilated cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, restrictive or left ventricular endocardial fibrosis, and endomyocarditis. Um, now, certainly, the number of dilated cases is down to less than one a year uh, following um, appropriate uh, dietary um, therapy in cats. But we still t see the others, and they still uh, form close to 10% of our total necropsies in the cat. Uh, 
And just to further define these uh, grossly, there's a normal heart, there's a dilated heart, and there's a hypertrophic heart. Now the problem is, until you actually look inside the heart or look at it histologically, it's very difficult to tell the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies from the endomyocarditis from the left ventricular endocardial fibrosis. And that's what we're going to talk about. In endomyocarditis, what you see is a diffuse or plaque-like reddening of the endocardium of the left ventricle, and the most common site for it is just underneath the aortic valves on the septal endocardium. You can also see it on the uh, free wall as well. Sometimes this lesion isn't nearly as often when you obvious when you first open the heart. You often have to wash these hearts out, put them in clot solution or in formalin before you can see the lesion. Histologically, what you see is acute inflammation, neutrophils and fibrin on the surface, some inflammation of the subendocardial myocardium. That progresses to a proliferation of blood vessels and um, fibroblasts, early granulation tissue, which is, goes on to more mature granulation tissue, also still with some inflammation, and we think leads directly to this condition restrictive cardiomyopathy or left ventricular endocardial fibrosis. The lesions are often in the same place in the left ventricular endocardium. We don't see this on the right side. Here's a uh, another gross picture of a fixed specimen and even after fixation you can see the dramatic endocardial fibrosis um, in these cats. And again they have severe endocardial fibrosis on the left ventricle which sometimes gets to be very mature connective tissue. And occasional you'll see thrombi attached to this endocardium, which leads to the aortic thromboemboli that are common in these cases. Interestingly enough, we also see a significant number of these cats that have acute interstitial pneumonia. This pneumonia looks very much like ARDS in other species. And for some reason, it's associated with the um, heart condition. We don't know why. It proceeds to type 2 cell hyperplasia. And to me, this is a bit of mystery to us. Uh, we have sent a lot of uh, our tissues from these cases and from unrelated feline heart cases to act as a control and from normal feline hearts down to Dr. Uh, Buffy Howarth at uh, Georgia. And she thinks she may have a lead on an infectious agent that may cause this. Uh, I'm not going to say what it is, but she's going to be reporting this at the AAVLD meeting in October. And I hope all the controls turn out well. Just to summarize, again, this is an old slide that included dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, some things that are unique about endomyocarditis is that the cats are usually younger than uh, the other diseases. The heart weight as a percentage of body weight is elevated in all of these diseases. We saw a lot more thromboembolic disease with restrictive cardiomyopathy than we did with endomyocarditis. And we see a lot of pneumonia, this interstitial pneumonia with the endomyocarditis and somewhat with the restricted with just a few with the dilated and the hypertrophic. So we wonder whether the insult in these cases is to the endocardium in these two diseases and to something in the lung. If the lung disease was purely a result of the heart disease, we'd expect a higher percentage in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases. Okay, moving on to another heart disease that we have investigated recently. Uh, this work was done by Sunita Driehaus, uh, one of our interns in the hospital, uh, who's now in private practice, but she got interested in myocardial infarcts in the dog. Um, they're very difficult to detect grossly in the dog. They're often just focal areas of reddening of the uh, myocardium. In some cases, you can see sort of a tan rim to the affected area on the endocardium. And usually they are wider on the endocardial surface and they get narrower as you go towards the epicardial surface, just like they do in humans. And this is due to the way the coronary arteries enter the heart. <coughs> 
we see some cases associated with atherosclerosis, but I would say the majority of our atherosclerosis cases do not have myocardial infarcts, and the majority of our myocardial infarct cases do not have atherosclerosis. So I want to emphasize this is a very different disease from in humans. In humans, over 90% of myocardial infarcts are due to coronary artery disease due to atherosclerosis. That is not the case in the dog, and that's why the incidence in the dog is very, very low in comparison to humans. What you'll find on the endocardial myocardium is areas of hemorrhage. When we get a little closer to these, you can see there's sort of a breakup of the myocardium with an infiltrate of neutrophils. So you can easily misdiagnose these as acute myocarditis, but it's the fact that these have distinct edges to them is very helpful. And of course, you never find any bacteria in them, except for the few that are veg associated with vegetative endocarditis. And so we have this fragmentation of the myocytes in the acute cases. In the subacute cases, we do have some granulation tissue around the outside, but again, usually there's a distinct border, and they usually are larger subendocardial than endocardial. Now, if you read our paper, you'll find out that the incidence of this in the dog is extremely low. Out of 6,000 necropsies, 4,000 dog and approximately 2,000 cat, I think we found 30 some cases in the dog and about six cases in the cat. So this is a very, very rare condition. And one of the reasons why we published it is because we wanted people to know that, yes, it does occur, but it's extremely rare. Occasionally, we have associated them with uh, pulmonary artery, I mean, I'm sorry, coronary artery thrombi. Uh, some of these cases had vegetative endocarditis. Other of them ha had steroid therapy and uh, renal disease and uh, pancreatitis, just as our other cases of thromboembolic disease do. So we think these are closely re closely, more closely related to thromboembolic disease than to coronary artery disease itself. Next, we're going to talk about um, acute hepatic necrosis associated with benzodiazepine therapy in the cat, and most of these were actually Valium. Most of the work here was done by Des Hughes in our critical care group. We looked at 10 cats. Uh, they had a wide age range. Uh, most were domestic short hairs and equal numbers of males and females. All had dramatic elevations in serum alkaline alanine aminotransferase and mild elevations of SAP and significant elevations in bilirubin and ammonia levels. Grossly, the livers were very uniform, modeled red and yellow with an accentuated lobular pattern and they were very small. In our shop, uh, livers and cats weigh around 3 to 3.5 percent of body weight, so these were very, very small, about a third to a ha uh, half normal size. Here's a photo of what they looked like grossly, very mottled. These were also very friable and extremely small. Histologically, we saw extensive acute hepatic necrosis that was central libular uh, with extension into the mid-zone and the periportal areas, and almost all the cats had extensive bile duct hyperplasia. We also saw tremendous secondary sinusoidal dilation, some hemorrhage, a lot of pigment-laden macrophages, a few animals had a cholangiohepatitis, and some had fatty change in the few remaining hepatocytes. On subgross, it looks like this. Uh, with the central libular areas very red, uh, with a thin rim of cells around the outside. When you get a little closer to this, what you don't see is hepatocytes. And in a ring around the outside are proliferating bile ducts. Here is a little higher magnification of the bile duct proliferation with just basically collapse of the lobule. There are very few hepatocytes left, remain. Um, almost all of these animals uh, had received Valium within 14 days before the time of their death. Okay, we're going to move on to talk about pancreatic disease now. And these have been a series of 
clinical pathological studies we have done looking at associations with canine acute pancreatitis. And for pathologists, this is not a difficult diagnosis, but as you, most of you know, this is still a very difficult diagnosis to make clinically. And so most of these have more clinical applications, uh, so I'll run through these rather quickly. Uh, most of this work was done by Rebecca Hess and others in our medicine and radiology group. As you know, in acute pancreatitis or acute necrotizing pancreatitis or acute pancreatic necrosis, we get extensive necrosis of the pancreas with necrosis of the adjacent fat. Uh, on cross-section, you can see the duodenum and there are large areas of necrosis and hemorrhage and fat necrosis in the pancreas. Histologically, extensive necrosis with lots of fibrin. Uh, you can sometimes just see an outline of the pancreatic cells. And there's also peripancreatic fat necrosis. And a rim of neutrophils often around these areas of necrosis. A few of the cases, uh, the ones that we talked uh, about as having uh, type 2 pancreatitis, that is acute necrotizing pancreatitis with interstitial fibrosis and inflammation, uh, did have some areas like this, but we only included animals in these studies if they also had pancreatic necrosis, even if there was pre-existing inflammation. We excluded animals that only had interstitial pancreatitis with fibrosis. Those animals usually have no clinical signs. We had a few animals with more suppurative pancreatitis. Those were very rare in comparison to the ones with pancreatic necrosis. And what we found is, as far as clinical and clinical pathology findings uh, associated with these, and these have been recently published in JAVMA, the animals could be either hypercalcemic or hypocalcemic, either hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. Most had an elevated amylase and lipase activity and were lipemia, and many of them had coagulopathies. What was found on the ultrastructure and on the uh, plain radiographs were that uh, abdominal ultrasound was more sensitive uh, than uh, abdominal radiographs. However, there were cases where abdominal radiographs uh, were more helpful. Uh, and so our basic conclusion is that both modalities should be used in looking at the abdomens of animals with pancreatitis. Dr. Hess also looked at risk factors associated with canine acute pancreatitis. And to briefly summarize a very, very long and complicated paper with control groups and everything else, what we found that Yorkshire Terriers were highly at risk. Uh, males and neutered females were at risk, as well as animals that were overweight or had any of the following endocrine diseases or gastrointestinal disease, as well as epilepsy. So all of these increase the risk of the animal developing pancreatitis. As far as the pathogenesis and why these risk factors are involved, we don't know. She also, at the same time, looked at concurrent disorders of dogs with diabetes mellitus with us. Um, and there was a little crossover between the diabetes mellitus cases and the pancreatitis cases. But animals with diabetes mellitus tended to have hyperadrenal corticism, either dermatitis or otitis, and urinary tract infections. Some of them certainly had acute necrotizing pancreatitis, and some also had either hypothyroidism or other neoplasms. I think this is just to emphasize the fact that diabetes mellitus is very, rarely a simple disease in the dog. Almost all of these dogs have other concurrent diseases that you need to be aware of. Okay, we're going to move on to talking about uh, kidney diseases. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about today is Lyme nephritis. Most of you have read the article in Vet Path, so I can go through this rather quickly. We still see large numbers of these cases, as you saw from our previous study that we talked about with breed incidence of neoplasia in the golden retriever and the labrador retriever. If your dog is going to die of something, if it doesn't die of neoplasia, it's very likely to die of Lyme nephritis. These kidneys are usually slightly swollen, smooth, and yellow tan. On cut section, they're also yellow tan. 
If I'd have showed you this kidney 20 years ago, everybody would have said amyloidosis. We stain these routinely for amyloid uh, grossly, and we also, of course, look histologically. And the vast majority of our kidneys that look like this, because we're in a Lyme disease endemic area, uh, are due to the condition that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Sometimes we do see ma some animals with infarcts as well in this group. Histologically, there is a severe membranoproliferative proliferative glomerulonephritis, severe tubular necrosis and regeneration, a moderate to severe interstitial nephritis, all together in the same kidney. Some of these animals also have some hemorrhage associated with some hyaline uh, vascular necrosis or fibrin fibrinoid vascular necrosis, and uh, we think this is due to hypertension. Many of these dogs have rather severe hypertension. And that hasn't been published on very much lately, but we have a couple people working on a clinical paper describing the hypertension. Again, just a higher magnification of this unique combination of tubular, interstitial, and glomerular lesions, which when we go back and look, we didn't see very many of them before about 20 years ago, and the incidence is, seems to still be going up. What we want to look at now, and a couple of people are getting a study started, we hope, is whether the new vaccines have had any effect on this. Certainly, we are seeing lots of cases, and we start seeing them at about this time of the year, and they continue through the fall, typically. Um, as Dr. Uh, Dombach reported in her paper, these animals have extensive IgM, IgG, and complement deposition here, and so we think we know the pathogenesis of the glomerular disease, but we're sort of clueless as far as the pathogenesis of the tubular disease. Um, we rarely find spirochetes in here. Uh, it's not like uh, leptospirosis where you see large numbers of spirochetes. I should also mention, by the way, that we're seeing lots more leptospirosis in the last few years than we had seen in the past. Uh, so we always have to be concerned about that when we see tubules and interstitial lesions like this. But we almost always these days stain these with Worth and Starry looking for leptospirosis and do not find it. Plus, we don't usually expect to see the glomerular disease with leptospirosis. Um, Dr. Dombach's initial studies, which were never published, uh, and I don't know if they ever will be, uh, did show that she was able to elute off uh, Borrelia burgdorferi antigen from these kidneys. Uh, just to remind you that we often see multi-organ hemorrhage with these cases because of the fibrinoid vascular necrosis from the hypertension. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that I was not directly involved in, but were done by people in our lab, so I can answer some questions about them, but probably not a lot. Uh, we're going to talk about some lymphoid and myeloid diseases. And the first one I want to talk about is one that uh, Drs. Walton and Hendrick have worked on, and that is feline Hodgkin's diseases. They have described 20 cases, and this paper has been submitted, so hopefully it will come out soon. And Hodgkin's disease in humans, as you probably know, is a slowly progressive sort of curable form of lymphoma, usually arising in a single site, um, and then progresses slowly to other contiguous sites. Um, mostly it's a nodal disease, um, and there's a series of pathological subclassifications of this condition. Um, what it consists of is a very minority of neoplastic cells in a highly inflammatory cell background. Uh, the classic uh, cells that are seen are the Reed-Sternberg cells, uh, which includes both mononuclear variants and lacunar cells, and the lymphohistiocytic cells, or popcorn cells, which have been demonstrated to be B cells in humans. The classic uh, Hodgkin's disease consists of the mixed cellular form, which includes reed sternberg cells, uh, and the nodular sclerosis form, which includes uh, lacunar cells and rare reed sternberg cells, on a background of inflammatory cells, with or without fibrous bands, which are predominant in the nodular sclerosis variant. 
Another form is the lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's disease, and these have the lymphocytic histiocytic cells or LNH cells or popcorn cells um, with a background of inflammatory cells, mostly lymphocytes. In the cats that uh, they looked at, 15 out of the 20 had a solitary submandibular or a cervical lymph node that was enlarged, often chronically. Um, two of them also involved the prescapular nodes. One was inguinal and one had multiple uh, nodes involved. Uh, as far as the subtypes, if you put them into the human subtypes, they had uh, the majority of them were either the lymphocyte predominant or the mixed cellular cellularity with a few nodular sclerosis or mixed. Histologically, these don't look like typical lymphomas. They have these very, very large uh, lymphohistiocytic cells or popcorn cells and a background of smaller lymphocytes and macrophages. And all of these, I mean, histochemistry stains on this one I'm going to show you are BLA36 to stain uh, B cells. And indeed, a large number of these uh, cells are B cells, but a lot of the uh, cells do not stain as B cells. Uh, this is another form, uh, again, showing some of these large cells, which uh, some cases do stain uh, as B cells. And in fact, this is thought to be a form of B cell lymphosarcoma with multiple other cell types involved. Here you can see, you see, can see the classic reed Sternberg cell here, the binucleate cell, um, sort of looking like owl's eyes looking at you. And again, these, the reed Sternberg cells are not positive uh, for the B cell markers that we have done, just as they are not in humans. But the lymphocytic histiocytic cells often are. Another example of the reed Sternberg cells seen in these tumors. So, in summary, for the mixed cellularity and nodular sclerosis uh, case, uh, we have lots of lymphocytes that are CD3 positive. The large Reed Sternberg uh, mono and multinucleate variants are BLA36 positive, and the few lymphohistiocytic cells are BLA36 positive. Here's a case of the nodular sclerosis form with lots of fibrous bands. Uh, in those cases, again, the critical thing was the BLA36 positive uh, mononuclear cells. Here's the lymphocyte predominant form. Again, uh, lots of these large lymphohistiocytic cells, uh, and they are also BLA36 positive. Uh, so in summary, feline Hodgkin's disease is analogous to human Hodgkin's disease. The classic Reed Sternberg cells are negative for T and B cell markers used, and the lymphohistiocytic cells are positive for the B cell markers. They also seem to act very much like um, Hodgkin's disease in humans, is that these uh, do not spread rapidly to other lymph nodes, and the animals usually have a relatively good prognosis. So we think it's important that you're able to recognize this condition in the cat, although it's relatively rare. The next study I want to mention is one done by uh, one of our clinical pathologists, Pat McManus, as well as uh, one of our anatomic pathologists, Lyndon Craig. And the reason why they did this study is there were a lot of rumors going around that the reason why you see leukocytosis in animals with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia is that there is some nonspecific stimulation of the bone marrow. Um, their feeling was that that probably was not the case and that there's probably other reasons for the bone marrow to be stimulated. stimulated. So what they went back and looked at is a correlation between leukocytosis and necropsy findings in a group of 34 um, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia patients. So everybody knows immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. It's real boring for pathologists because you get these bright yellow dogs with often big spleens and large livers uh, hyperplastic bone marrow, 
um, and no cause. However, most of us that look at a lot of these dogs know that there are a lot of other things going on in these animals that make them ill. They often have multi-organ failure, often due to infarcts. These are in the spleen here, but we also see them in the kidneys. Uh, we see pulmonary artery thrombosis. We see a lot of changes throughout uh, these dogs. Uh, myocardial infarcts occasionally. Here's another example of that spleen with a large splenic infarct and the thrombus in the splenic vein. Uh, we've also seen these dogs with portal vein thrombosis. And frequently there is central libular necrosis in the liver due to both the combination of increased uh, central venous pressure from their pulmonary artery thrombi or from the severe anemia. So many of these animals have multi-organ necrosis uh, and inflammation or infarcts. And so what they did is uh, simply correlated uh, the white blood cells with the severity of the necropsy lesions. And indeed, the animals with mild necropsy lesions tend to have very low white counts. The ones with very severe lesions have very high white counts. There were four cases that were excluded uh, from the severe group um, that had uh, degenerative left shifts. And I don't know what that means, but I don't have to. So. Uh, and their conclusions were that elevations in white count and neutrophilic left shift and toxic chains in the neutrophils uh, should uh, alert clinicians to the potential for severe tissue injury. Um, and the lesions occur in these cases uh, should make the clinician be aware of uh, concerns for thromboembolic disease. I'm sorry, and the other conclusion they reached was, of course, that the elevations in white count are most likely the results of the tissue injury um, and not due to some nonspecific stimulation of the bone marrow. Okay, uh, next we're going to move along to talk about thyroid disease, and this is a study that's mostly be done, been done by Jennifer Chapman in our medicine group. Uh, in fact, she did all the immunohistochemistry herself on this study after a little... Uh, introduction to it by one of our technicians. Um, and this is a, a concern we have because in the postmortem room for years, we've seen many animals with thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia or adenomas that as far as we could tell were euthyroid. They were uh, not cats that were losing weight or eating a lot, and they often had a lot of other severe conditions that led to their death. Um, so what Dr. Chapman did is that she hypothesized that there could be lots of cats with adenomatous hyperplasia and adenoma in the absence of hyperthyroidism. And we went back and looked at around 30 cats uh, at their necropsy results. Um, and I'm sure there was 26 cats in this group. They were mostly older cats. They were mostly slightly uh, overweight. Um, and over half of them died of neoplasia, and a lot of those were lymphosarcomas. So what she did is she went back and looked at all of these cats and looked at their necropsy finding as well as their T3 and T4 results. And basically, she found a group of animals that had thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia or adenoma and were euthyroxemiac. So that we feel that these adenomas or nodules were incidental findings similar to nodular hyperplasia in other organ systems. Uh, this is something that many feline practitioners have known for years, that they will typically palpate an old cat's thyroid, find large thyroid glands, but the animals are repeatedly tested for hyperthyroidism and are euthyroid. And of course, these animals had none of the clinical signs of hyperthyroidism. Well, the people that are in the thyroid business didn't want to believe that, so she proceeded then uh, to do another uh, study. Again, I'll mention again, the T4s were lower than you'd expect in hyperthyroid or sick euthyroid syndrome cats, um, and they had no evidence of disease associated with hyperthyroidism. So what she then proceeded to do is stain immunohistochemically for thyroglobulin and T3 in thyroid glands of normal cats, hyperthyroid cats with adenomas and adenomatous hyperplasia, and cats with thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia and euthyroxemia. And again, 
Dr. Chapman is the person that did most of this work. So our hypothesis was that cats with thyroid adenite, uh, um, thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia who were euthyroid would have less thyroglobulin T4 and T3 in their adenomatous tissue than hyperthyroid cats. And conversely, uh, they would have normal amounts of thyroglobulin T4 and T3 in their non-adenomatous tissue. So this is a normal feline thyroid with anti-thyroglobulin antibody which stains the colloid very nicely and the cells. This is a T3 results, very similar in a normal thyroid. And this is anti-thyroid, anti-thyroglobulin antibody in a thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia cat that was euthyroid. And there is the parathyroid which doesn't stain with thyroglobulin. And there is the normal thyroid which does stain with thyroglobulin as would be, as would be expected in a normal cat that had normal TSH levels. When we looked at antithyroglobulin antibody in a thyroid adenomatous hyperplasia cat that was euthyroid, you can see the adenoma itself stains hardly at all. But then if you look at a known hyperthyroid cat's adenoma, it stains extensively with thyroglobulin. Conversely, its normal or atrophied, actually, thyroid tissue next to it does not stain with thyroglobulin. However, the cat that is euthyroid does. This gives us more evidence that cats that are hyperthyroid, their adenomas are making thyroglobulin, as you'll see later also T3 and T4. But in the cats in our study group, they are not. This is the T3 antibody. Again, here's the same adenoma in a euthyroxemia cat and the um, T3 is present in their normal follicles and very little of it is present in the adenomatous follicles where just the opposite is seen in the hyperthyroid cat. So our conclusions are the adenomatous tissue in the hyperthyroid cat has more intense staining for thyroglobulin and T3, T3 than the adenomatous tissue in the euthyroid cats. So we do not feel that all cats with adenomatous hyperplasia or adenomas have an overproduction of thyroid hormone. Many of them are euthyroxemic. So you cannot use uh, the examination of the nodule of the cat with H&E stain to determine whether an animal is hyperthyroid or not. You either have to do the T3s and T4s or do the immunohistochemistry to demonstrate. Okay, another study uh, which has been done on the skeletal system, which is very foreign to me, uh, done by Dr. Craig here, is looking at what she at one ca time called epiphyseolysis, but now she thinks of as a physeal dysplasia in the cat. Uh, and she has looked at 13 cases all through our biopsy service in the last three years. These cats had lameness. There was no history of trauma. About half of them were bilateral. And at least one cat had a litter mate that was also uh, similarly affected. Over 90% of them are overweight. Uh, most are male. And a lot of them were Siamese, much greater than our uh, clinic population of 5% Siamese. So we're looking at overweight male cats with a separation of the end of the femur, the femoral head, from the shaft at the physis. And again, this one was bilateral. And what we see, receive on the biopsy service are the top of the femoral head. Everything looks pretty normal except for the juncture uh, at the point of the break. Uh, here is a normal uh, progression of uh, cartilage in the area of the femoral uh, physis. In these affected cats, the uh, chondrocytes are in small clusters on both sides of the separation and there is abnormal matrix in between. And I don't have the stains to show that but the matrix also stains abnormally for Alcyon Blue and uh, PAS. 
Uh, here is the other side on the shaft side, and you again see these abnormal clusters of uh, cartilage. So Dr. Craig uh, feels that this is a, a form of physeal dysplasia, uh, where the um, uh, cartilage is formed abnormally, and it makes them more sensitive to uh, separation, and perhaps the obesity uh, is somehow involved in that, but we're not sure exactly how. Uh, anyways, this is becoming a rather common skeletal condition in the cat. And uh, that article has been accepted for publication and hopefully will be out in the next year. Okay, I briefly want to talk about some conditions of the skin and subcutis. Dr. Goldschmidt certainly covered uh, much of this uh, in the first day. Uh, but this is a condition that I'm familiar with only through uh, my wife who has done much of this work. Uh, and that's a... Uh, her initial work in the molecular analysis of the oncogenes in feline vaccine-associated sarcomas. Uh, you're all probably familiar with these, or those of you that certainly do any biopsy work are. These are large masses, usually in the intrascapular region in the cat. Uh, histologically, these have central areas of necrosis, often where you can find vaccine product in macrophages, a rim of sarcomatous tissue, often which has a rim of uh, inflammatory cells around the outside, particularly lymphocytes. Uh, histologically, these are often very pleomorphic, often with multinucleated giant cells. Some of them are liposarcomas, some of them are uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, others are osteosarcomas, and others are just poorly differentiated sarcomas or fibrosarcomas. I'm sure some of you see more of these than I do. Um, in many of these cases, you can actually find the sort of uh, brownish-blue vaccine product in the macrophages, often adjacent to the lymphocytes in the area. Um, what she found in a previous immunohistochemical study, which I'll show you some of the results of, were that there was overexpression of platelet-derived growth factor and its receptor NC June in these tissues. Uh, PDGF, as you know, is an important growth factor which affects many cells including fibroplasts. Uh, in these animals, the neoplastic cells and the peripheral lymphocytes were positive for PDGF and the neoplastic cells were also positive for PDGF receptor, especially those near the tumor lymphocyte interface at the periphery. And here are some of the lymphocytes at the periphery of these lesions and this is staining for platelet-derived growth factor. Uh, these are some of the tumor cells staining for platelet-derived growth, growth factor. This is a little close-up of that, and the receptor in this case is also being stained. So her hypothesis is that the interaction of the lymphocytes producing the PDGF and locally dividing myofibroblasts may predispose toward neoplastic transformation of the local mesenchymal cells. Um, she also feels that the production of the PGF, PDGF and PDGF receptor by the transformed mesenchymal cells leads to an autocrine stimulation and continued proliferation. And their concern is that elevated levels of PDGF may lead to overexpression of C-June uh, that augments, augments the proliferative response. Um, at the current time, what she's trying to do is confirm the overexpression of PDGF, PDGFR, and C-June uh, through PCR cloning and our RNA's protection assay. And that work is going on uh, in uh, her lab as well as in other labs around the United States, all uh, supported by the Vaccine-Associated Feline Sarcoma Task Force. Uh, and so far, this is looking very interesting. We may actually have a common veterinary tumor where we actually know something about the pathogenesis. Now I'm going to talk about uh, some disorders of the central nervous system. Now the first thing I want to do is tell you about a spinal cord disease study we have done in the cat uh, with uh, one of our uh, neurologists, uh, and that's Dr. Charles Veet, who will be writing this up hopefully shortly. Uh, we're also working with one of our uh, new pathology residents, uh, Dr. Newton. What we did is we went back and looked at uh, 2,600 feline necropsies and found that the spinal cord had been looked at in 258 of them. 
Uh, we eliminated the animals with normal spinal cords and with minimal lesions. Uh, and we also added to that uh, 36 cats that had spinal cords submitted through our biopsy service that had lesions. And what we did is divided into different categories. And I'm just going to briefly run through these categories. Hopefully, um, Dr. Veet will get this paper out and have it published within a year or two. Um, as far as congenital inherited lesions, they made up about 11% of our cases. Um, uh, seven of these were diseases of the vertebral column itself and nine were of the spinal cord, and most of those were various storage diseases. As far as de degenerative diseases, they were relatively rare. Uh, we did find uh, neuroaxonal dystrophy in five cats, and interestingly, these, these were all uh, domestic short hair cats. I think we have another one to add to that group now. We had one cat with spinal cord involvement with a paddoencephalo, cephalopathy or a paddoencephalomyelopathy, and um, a couple of animals with we, what we called chronic idiopathic myelomalacia, we're not sure what caused them. In inflammatory diseases, they uh, constituted the largest group of diseases in the spinal cord, and the majority of those animals had feline infectious peritonitis, and all the ones with spinal cord disease also had brain disease. Uh, the others were divided between animals with cryptococcal disease, bacterial inflammatory disease, uh, polioencephalomyelitis, the idiopathic disease of the cat, two animals with toxoplasma, plasma, and six animals with inflammation without uh, fitting into a known category or etiology. Fifteen percent of our cats had spinal cord disease due to trauma. This was usually due to vertebral col column injury or disease. Very few of them were intervertebral disc disease, and this contrasts with both what's in the literature on the cat and what is seen in the dog. Um, there are a couple papers out there by surgeons about intervertebral disc disease in the cat. I suspect it's something they can deal with, so they talk about it. But at least on our survey, it was a very small percentage of the case. And then we had three animals that had direct trauma to the spinal cord. We are in West Philly, so most of them were some sort of projectile. Neoplastic disease were also a relatively large percentage of the cats with uh, disease of the spinal cord. We had a large group of animals with lymphosarcoma, which I'll talk about in a little more detail later. Twelve animals had vertebral column neoplasia, osteo, fibro, undifferentiated sarcomas with impingement on the uh, spinal cord. And five animals had extradural uh, neoplasms, three undifferentiated sarcomas, and two peripheral nerve sheath tumors. There were very few neoplastic diseases inside the dura. Six animals had uh, meningeal uh, neoplasms. Uh, three of them were meningiomas, and three were malignant fibrous histiocytomas. And there were only four animals with intramedullary uh, neoplasms. Two were primitive neuroectodermal tumors, one oligodendroglioma, and one giant cell tumor which very much resembled the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma mentioned uh, earlier in the week. As far as infarcts, ischemia, and malacic diseases, we did see 15 cats uh, with this sort of condition. Three of them fit with the traumatic feline ischemic myelopathy that's been described by uh, Brian Summers uh, in his book. And they're usually young cats with external trauma without trauma to the vertebral column itself. Uh, and they think it's probably some sort of ischemic change. Uh, we had five animals with infarcts due to vascular or cardiac disease and seven animals with malacia of unknown cause which could have been trauma or infarcts. Okay, and that's uh, the result of that study, and that hopefully will be coming out shortly. Next, I want to talk a while about necrotizing meningoencephalitis of small breed dogs, such as pug encephalitis and uh, related disease in the dogs, and how this compares to granulomatous meningoencephalitis. Uh, much of this work was done by Dr. Stalas in collaboration with others uh, at Cornell, uh, Australia, and back at Penn with Dr. Daryl Hart. There are a large group of meningoencephalitis of known cause. 
Uh, certainly in the United States, the bulk of them are canine distemper in the dog. We see occasional rabies cases. Um, I only rarely see uh, pseudorabies or uh, canine adenovirus infection. We also see meningoencephalitis from herpes virus. It's been reported from parainfluenza virus, although I've never seen one. And I've never really seen a parvovirus associated case either. There have been reported cases of lacrosse virus causing meningoencephalitis of dogs. And there, of course, are post vaccinal encephalitis with distemper and rabies in the dog. We also see meningoencephalitis from protozoal disease, rickettsial disease. Uh, bacterial and mycotic disease, and of course there's inflammation secondary to trauma, neoplasia, and other kinds of necrosis. We also have a series of syndromes of meningoencephalitis, but we don't know their cause. That is GME, necrotizing meningoencephalitis involving pugs, Maltese, Yorkshires. We've seen them in Shizus, Chinese crested dogs. There's a syndrome of periventricular encephalitis, which we really don't have any in our files. And there are occasional cases which fit into the category of steroid responsive or immune mediated meningitis and arteritis in the dog. We also see eosinophilic meningoencephalitis in the dog and rarely granulomatous leptomeningitis of beagle dogs. And uh, I personally have not seen pyogranulomatous meningoencephalitis of pointer dogs, but it is reported in the literature. We also have a large group of unclassified meningoencephalitis of unknown cause. They're usually assumed to be viral or immune mediated, and we define them by exclusion. We don't find a, an agent that causes them, and they don't morphologically resemble the previously described defined syndromes. So I just want to briefly talk about necrotizing meningoencephalitis, or pug dog, or Maltese dog, or Yorkie dog meningoencephalitis, and GME. There are some differences. Uh, there are differences in age and onset. Uh, that is, uh, pug dogs tend to be relatively young, as do Maltese and Yorkshires, where GME cases could often be older dogs, although usually they are in the one to three year range. Clinically, the clinical signs can be somewhat similar or different depending on what part of the nervous system is affected. However, in pugs and Maltese, there are usually seizures in cerebral signs. In Yorkies, there often are brain stem signs as well as seizures. And in GME, it really depends on where the brain is affected. In all these cases, they can be both acute onset or there can be chronic neurological disease. And their response to therapy is highly variable. Uh, some dogs are successfully treated for a variable period of time with corticosteroids. Uh, some pugs have been treated with CCNU and radiation successfully. The one thing we do know is whenever you give them corticosteroids, their CSF protein and cell counts decrease rather dramatically. All of them have elevated protein in their CSF and increased number of cells in their CSF, at least before you give them steroids. And grossly, these conditions can be quite identical. Often there are no gross lesions seen. However, you may see variable changes in the gray matter, in the white matter, and various changes in the ventricles. This is a case of GME in the dog with an asymmetric dilation of the ventricles in areas of necrosis and inflammation. Here's another case of GME with just dramatic swelling. This is another case of GME uh, with changes in the white matter and the gray matter on this side and on this side. This is a case of Maltese encephalitis with inflammation, asymmetrical dilation of the ventricle, atrophy. This is another case of uh, Maltese encephalitis, and this could easily be a case of pug encephalitis with extensive swelling and edema and there's going to be necrosis of this white and gray matter as well as inflammation. Often asymmetrical. Another case uh, from a pug uh, with areas of necrosis and loss of normal white matter and swelling. This is from a Chinese crested dog with depressions in the cerebral cortex caudally, swelling rostrally. Uh, 
histologically extensive necrosis and inflammation. Differences include histopathology. GME, we expect angiocentric inflammation made up of epithelioid macrophages as well as lymphocytes and plasma cells. Here we have a typical GME cases, perivascular cuffs of large epithelioid macrophages mixed with a few lymphocytes. But the critical feature is the large macrophage-like cells, which have been demonstrated recently to be of macrophage monocyte origin. As far as the Pugs, Maltese, and Yorkies, if I handed you the slides from the cerebral cortical areas uh, from multiple different cases, I don't think you could tell them apart. They're often regionally extensive areas of necrosis and inflammation, lots of different inflammatory cells, variable amounts of gliosis depending on how long it's been going on, and the chronic lesions often have large cavities in the white matter. Here again is a typical lesion of one of the necrotizing encephalitis, a lot of inflammation and necrosis. And in the old burned out lesions, you have cavity formation in the white and gray matter, or often right at the junction. There will be clusters of inflammatory cells around blood vessels without the large macrophage-like cells or histiocytic cells, and extensive glial response as well. Lots of inflammation often right at the meninges and extending into the um, subpeal gray matter. And often an increase in astrocytes. As far as dis differences, we do see a difference in distribution. The pugs and Maltese pretty much are restricted to the telencephalon with rare involvement of the thalamus. Um, where in the Yorkies, and I've seen some of these cases in the United States now, we certainly see brainstem involvement, uh, cerebellum and medulla, as well as the telencephalon. However, they usually are bilateral, but often asymmetrical in all three of these breeds, and in the Chinese crested and the Shih Tzus and the others we've seen. In GME, there's involvement of lots of different systems. I've seen it predominate in the spinal cord, predominate in the telencephalon, predominate in the brain stem. We've even seen some peripheral nerve involvement with granulomatous meningoencephalitis. Um, and they can be bilateral and symmetrical in the pug as well as in the, uh, as in the dogs with GME. Okay, um, now we're going to move on to a study that's been recently completed by uh, Shona Smith, one of our residents, uh, who's now in our uh, instructor in our lab, and this is on cerebral vascular hamartomas in the dog. Uh, she was able to collect five of these cases. They all have somewhat similar lesions. All the lesions were in the area of the uh, anterior part of the brain. Here's one peeking out from the piriform lobe. On cross-section, they are often either here or somewhat more towards the midline. Uh, sometimes they're associated with extensive hemorrhage. Histologically, they're all relatively similar, uh, either uh, rather dilated or sometimes very small blood vessels. Um, these blood vessels have a very thin wall with intervening neuropil. Uh, sometimes they have thrombi in the uh, vascular structures. Uh, the vascular structures are usually bordered by actin-positive cells. Here's the, these are the blood vessels. This is an immunohistochemistry for actin. They are further lined by factor VIII positive endothelial cells and again have intervening neuropil. And uh, the way these are defined is they have to have intervening neuropil. This is defined by the GFAP stain. And in this case is defined by the neurofilament stain showing axons intervening between the vascular structures. So we feel these are probably not um, tumors of endothelial origin, uh, some sort of hemangioma, but represent a developmental defect or a hamartoma uh, where these are probably pre-existing and probably only cause clinical signs when they grow large enough or become filled with blood or bleed. 
So again, this should be coming out in vet path in the next couple of months. Okay. Um, briefly, I just want to bring you up to date on one form of cerebellar abiotrophy that we've been investigating. Uh, you can see cerebellar Beller abiotrophy in lots of different uh, species and breeds. It's very, very common in the dog, uh, where sometimes you have, here's a normal dog, here's a mildly affected dog, and here's a severely affected dog. Often these are obvious grossly. Um, they all have a different onset as far as uh, age, as far as when the cerebellum starts to degenerate. And most of them that have been investigated so far have been shown to be autosomal recessive inherited diseases. And uh, this is a typical example of one that we see in the beagle, where we see Purkinje cells in a normal animal. Here's the molecular layer, there's the granular cell layer, this is a normal one. And this is the animal with cerebellar abiotrophy, loss of Purkinje cells, increased number of astrocytes in the molecular layer, and a thinning of the uh, granular cell layer. What we've been looking at recently is a group of related Old English sheepdogs that have a maturity onset very mild form of the disease that only affects the paravermal cortical um, cerebellum. These animals go on and live a long life and die of other diseases. They just have an unusual gait. Um, it's again just, this is one of the more severely affected animals, and it's only the three or four uh, folia adjacent to the vermis. Sometimes there's some vermal involvement. And it looks very typical of the other forms of cerebellar abiotrophy, but the difference is you have to cut the cerebellum very carefully to make sure you get the uh, paravermal cortex and look at it at a couple different levels or you'll miss these lesions like I did the first couple times. Um, in these dogs, we also see one other change, and this is a normal age-matched control dog cerebellar nucleus, and you can look at the number of glial cells in here. And this is an affected dog, and they have an increased number of glial cells here. Uh, Dr. Jerry Bell did the genetics on these, uh, and uh, Dr. Steve Steinberg is, uh, had this paper now accepted in JAVMA, and uh, this is an autosomal recessively inherited disease of the Old English sheepdog. Yet one more uh, cerebellar abiotrophy. All right, I uh, just want to briefly talk about brain infarcts in the dog. You know, we've talked about a lot of other forms of thromboembolic disease. Uh, this is a, another thromboembolic disease that I'm just going to mention briefly. Uh, we did this study years ago, never got around to publishing it. I'm not actually sure when it's going to get published. Uh, we basically saw about 45 dogs with thromboembolic disease of the brain. About a third of them had disease of the brain with vascular disease or thrombi. Uh, Many of these had intravascular lymphomas. We've subsequently put together uh, about twice this number of cases of intravascular lymphoma and are collaborating with Sean McDonough at Cornell, who is publishing these with uh, also a large number of cases from their institution. And that paper uh, is somewhere in the process of being accepted or uh, uh, on intravascular lymphoma. Uh, what Sean has done is gone back and looked at these immunohistochemistry. It, chemically and demonstrated that in the dog at least they represent both B cells, T cells, and non-B, non-T uh, uh, lymphocytes. We also saw a dog with dogs with meningeal venous thrombi, atherosclerosis, a few dogs with fibroid vascular necrosis, and one each with amyloidosis or arterial thrombi. Uh, this is a case of the intravascular lymphoma. These neoplastic cells just sit in the vessels. They do not circulate. You can't take a blood sample and find these uh, cells. They're highly pleomorphic B and T cells, depending on the case. And they occlude the vessels and lead to infarction of the brain. Uh, this is something else we've seen a few times that we don't understand, and that's uh, venous infarcts in the brain. The venous sinuses and the veins on the surface of the brain uh, are thrombosed, uh, and they lead to infarcts throughout the brain. Here's one of these uh, venous infarcts. Some of these also have a phlebitis. We've never associated a known infectious agent with these. In humans and in primates, they are associated with intracranial surgery. 
but none of our dogs have had previous intracranial surgery. So this is sort of idiopathic phlebothrombosis in the dog brain. We occasionally see dogs with atherosclerosis associated with either uh, hypothyroidism or diabetes mellitus with uh, brain infarcts as well. Here's an infarct in this dog's brain with some cholesterol clefts uh, in it. We also saw about a third of our dogs had reason to have embolic disease to the brain. Vegetative endocarditis, hemangiosarcoma traveling in the blood vessel, previous myocardial infarcts, all of these dogs uh, were thought to have embolic induced uh, brain infarcts. And then about a third of our cases, I'm sorry, here's a one of the uh, hemangiosarcoma cases with the middle cerebral artery distribution uh, infarcted on one side of the brain. And then about a third of the cases, we did not find any reason for uh, their infarcts. There was no evidence of thromboli, emboli, or vascular disease or a source of emboli. Um, and we've just lined up the diseases we saw this with. Uh, some of them had endocardiosis, so maybe there was an embolic phenomenon that we didn't detect. Uh, some of them had neoplasia. Some had multi-organ infarction of unknown cause. So this is a very enigmatic group, but they're out there and represent about a third of the cases we see. Dr. Schulman has also already covered uh, much about central nervous system neoplasia in domestic animals. Um, and I'm just going to briefly review a couple of studies we've done that support uh, much of what uh, she has concluded and what has been published in the uh, new WHO um, nomenclature of tumors of domestic animals. This is a study we did in the cat. Uh, and it is one that we're hoping that uh, Dr. Kapak and one of our surgeons will be uh, publishing shortly. What we did is we went back and looked at our last 2,800 necropsies and 45,000 biopsies, looking for a diagnosis of brain or spinal cord neoplasia. And we reviewed all these slides. We did some immunohistochemical staining, when we thought was appropriate for T or B cells and for astrocytes. And what we found was about 200 cats with central nervous system tumors, 176 in the brain and 25 in the spinal cord. We also included in the study 19 cats with vertebral column and canal neoplasia that impinged upon uh, the spinal cord. Um, among the brain tumors, as you've already heard, meningiomas are by, by far the most common, but the next two most common intracranial tumors were lymphosarcoma and pituitary tumors, all around 15% of the tumor load. After that, everything was very rare. We saw four astrocytomas, four metastatic tumors, three ependymomas, two oligos, one maybe choroid plexus cystodoma, I'm still not sure about that, and one primitive neuroectodermal tumor. Um, this is just to show you what some of the gliomas look like. Uh, they're uh, very common. Uh, Lee, in this site in the brain, uh, almost all of them were there. This is a very anaplastic uh, astrocytoma. This was a glioblastoma multiforme. We only saw one of these in our survey of 200 cats with tumors. Um, we saw two oligodendrogliomas, and you can see the very classic features of the oligodendroglioma plus the uh, glomeruli, glomeruliform like uh, endothelial proliferation. As far as meningiomas, we did see, I mean, sorry, this is an ependymoma. They look very similar to the third ventricular meningiomas, but we often see ependymomas in this site, and these ependymomas have pseudo rosettes that are formed. And we saw one primitive neuroectodermal tumor. It happened to be in the cerebellum, so you could also call it a medulloblastoma. Um, the primitive neuroectodermal tumors, the pseudo rosettes, and the rosettes show up much more nicely when you put a GFAP stain on them, which uh, this one did stain for faintly. Meningioma is again very common. We don't see this very often anymore because almost all the meningiomas we get these days are through our biopsy service, not through our necropsy service. But here's a typical meningioma with dramatic compression of the uh, cerebral cortex and herniation of the cerebellum.
Here's the meningioma in the third ventricle. As you can see, it looks very similar to that ependymoma I showed you. Meningiomas in cats are mostly meningothelial, transitional, or samomatous. They don't seem to have the variety of meningiomas that we see in the dog. And as far as location, the vast majority of them are over the cerebrum, uh, and so these can usually be removed surgically quite easily. Um, and then decreasing numbers in the third ventricle, cerebellum, diencephalon, or more caudal brainstem. As far as age goes, these were mostly older cats, mostly domestic short hairs. In our study, more males than females were seen. And again, uh, of the more recent cases, the 50 or 60 that are biopsies, um, seven of them have had repeated uh, biopsies following recurrence. But the cats are still doing fine in most cases. Lymphosarcoma in the cat brain, we typically think of it as a meningeal lesion. However, recently we've been seeing more mass-like lymphosarcomas in the cat. Here's another one. And these are poorly circumscribed proliferations of lymphocytes, usually in a single site, with or without meningeal involvement. Uh, this one happened to be almost all CD3 positive. We also see others that are BLA36 positive. So we see both T cell and B cell tumors. And unfortunately, we also see ones like this. This is the CD3 staining on this lymphosarcoma. This is the BLA36 on this lymphosarcoma. We see some that are clearly mixed, and I don't understand that. We also see lymphosarcoma involving the vertebral canal and the spinal cord. Papers have been published showing that they're mostly intradural, mostly extradural. We see them in both sites. When we compared lymphosarcoma in the brain versus the spinal cord, we found that our uh, spinal cord lymphosarcoma cats were younger uh, than our uh, brain lymphosarcoma cats. In the uh, brain lymphosarcoma, they had mass lesions in a much greater percentage of the cases than were in the spinal cord. Um, and um, they were focal only in the brain in a higher percentage of cases that were in this, than were in the spinal cord, as well as being locally extensive more often than in the spinal cord, uh, where only a little over half of the lymphosarcomas in the brain involved multiple systems outside the uh, brain. The majority of those in the spinal cord involved multiple systems. And again, I told you about the immunohistochemical findings. You can see that we have a, a very confusing immunohistochemical picture with T cells, B cell tumors, TB cell tumors, BT cell tumors, and ones that don't stain for T or B cells in both sites. Interestingly enough, in the ones that were looked at in the brain, only one of them was FELV positive, and only one of them was FIV positive. Very different from what you might have heard in, from other sources. Where in the spinal cord, over half of them approximately were FELV positive, and only one was FIV positive. So if FIV-induced lymphosarcoma is a model for what occurs in the human, it at least isn't a spontaneous disease of significance in the cat. In the spinal cord tumors, uh, just to summarize them, we also saw the majority of them being lymphosarcoma, a few meningiomas, and malignant fibrous histiocytomas, and just a few of these other tumors, as I mentioned previously. The extraleural tumors were almost all sarcomas, with the majority of them being osteosarcomas. There was two schwannomas and two myelomas. So in summary, meningiomas, as we all knew, are most common brain tumor in the cat. Pituitary tumors are relatively common in the cat. Glial tumors are rare. And lymphosarcoma was the second most common brain tumor and the most common spinal cord tumor in the cat. Lymphosarcoma in the spinal cord tends to occur in younger cats as part of multisystemic lymphosarcoma, where lymphosarcoma in the brain is often solitary with or without other organ involvement. And these cats are usually negative for FIV and, EF and FELB. And also, as I mentioned to some of you earlier, we've seen about 10 cases of animals with meningioma and either a lymphosarcoma or a pituitary tumor. Okay, I want to talk uh, to you briefly about this condition, a canine pleomorphic meningeal sarcoma, which we think might be a form of malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Uh, 
We just had another of these cases uh, a few weeks ago. This is the only paper that I've ever, only abstract I've ever published with my wife, so it's a unique one. Uh, Brian Summers and uh, Dr. Smith were also involved. Um, this is a MFH is a soft tissue sarcoma. It's been described in a variety of species. Has a heterogeneous cell population of spindle cells, pleomorphic histiocytoid cells, giant cells, and a lot of inflammatory cells. And it's thought to be of myofibroblast origin. It has a variety of different patterns, the storiform being the most common. We also see the inflammatory and the giant cell form in domestic animals. We have not identified the myxoid or angiotomoid form. Immunohistochemically, the cells are usually positive for actin, vimentin, and desmond. Um, they may be positive for S100 lysozyme, they're usually negative for keratins, GFAP, neurofilament, and lymphocyte markers. The tumors tend to wrap around the spinal cord, forming a ring. This can extend for almost the entire length of the spinal cord, or only regionally involve it. And the ones we've seen most commonly have been in the lumbar area. Histologically, these are higher, highly pleomorphic cells with a background of lymphocytes uh, and plasma cells and occasional neutrophils. Um, this is a staining for vimentin, showing that almost all of these bizarre neoplastic cells are vimentin positive. They are almost all usually actin positive as well, although some are not. And here you can see the spinal cord with GAP positive uh, astrocytes in the spinal cord and the neoplastic cells are negative. The neoplastic cells are also negative for keratins and only rarely do we find them positive for lysozyme. So to summarize, there were vimentin positive, actin positive, only one was lysozyme positive. We have another since then that was also lysozyme negative, and they're not positive for these other markers. So we suspect these are a form of malignant fibrous histiocytoma that occurs in the meninges. Uh, we've also seen one case that involved the meninges of the brain. This has been called a variety of different things, mesenchymal neoplasms. Uh, it's been called meningeal sarcomatosis. Uh, disseminated meningeal tumor. We suspect this is all the same uh, tumor. Uh, and now that we've received one more case, hopefully we'll get around to publishing our series. Um, and they're similar to what we've seen before. And again, uh, the little electron microscopy that's been done is consistent with primitive mesenchymal cells with uh, various filaments that are probably vimentin and actin and no junctional complexes. And the EM on this, uh, two, two of the cases were done by um, Brian Summers at Cornell. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is just a brief discussion of uh, primitive neuroectodermal tumors in the cat, dog, and the mouse. Uh, we're not going to actually discuss the mouse. Uh, or the cat in this case, uh, but I just want to uh, go over some of this uh, mostly to repeat some of the things that Dr. Schulman has already mentioned. Um, we found again that these tumors were present in the cerebellum, but also in the cerebrum and uh, spinal cord. We now have about 14 of these cases. The classic ones are called medulloblastomas or primitive neuroectodermal tumors that are in the um, area of the brainstem and cerebellum. Uh, but we do see them in the cortex. And increasingly, we've identified in a number of cases in the cerebral cortex in a group of dogs in the last four or five years. So as I said, we now have about 14 of these tumors. Uh, as mentioned before, they often have sort of carrot shape, but some of them are very round. And so these ones that are very round, our real concern is primary brain lymphosarcoma. So we uh, not only look at markers for nervous system uh, cells, we also look extensively for B cell, T cell markers, and macrophage markers. And we've also been using a CD18 marker from uh, Dr. Peter Moore at California that uh, stains uh, histiocytic cells and microglial cells, as I show you later. And these tumors all, by definition, have to be negative for those. Uh, here's another form of the tumor where you get these sort of vague rosettes and clusters. Um, this is a GFAP staining showing that most of them are GFAP positive. 
Vimentin, they're mostly Vimentin positive as well. Uh, here's one that has some GFAP positive cells, but many negative cells. This is a neurofilament stain. One or two of ours have been positive for neurofilament, showing neuronal differentiation, although they don't look like neurons. And we've had one case that was synaptophysin positive. Uh, critically, also, this is a normal microglial cell in the adjacent brain, which stains nicely with CD18. All of our tumors are CD18 negative. So these are not a form of microgliomatosis. So in summary, uh, again, we have about 14 cases now. Uh, the majority of them are positive for GFAP. Uh, all but one so far have been positive for Vimentin. And we've had a few uh, that are positive for neurofilament. It's not listed here. All are negative for keratin. One is positive for actin. And we've had none that are positive for uh, Desmond.